one of the really fundamental shifts I think that's happening right now with the nature of power is that you know, it's no longer sufficient just to be the most materially powerful or the, or the wealthiest. You also need this capacity to mobilize the citizenry. And, the, and the one way they're calling it is like a power and outcome. You need to be able to, to mobilize people. That's one of the, the core aspects of power, to, power today. And I think that that capacity to mobilize people is what activists excel at. And so in many ways, even though it feels like you don't have power, you actually are the only, you, you have this, this unique ability. It's not easy, but you do have a unique ability as a youth or just as an outsider to, to spark a social movement or to spark a social protest. And that capacity, I think, um, is integral to the new functioning of power. All of you here today are examples of youth who've achieved a lot in their respective ac areas of activism. So maybe going down the line, starting with Naomi, could you please give us a brief description of what you're currently working on? Um, when I was 11, I held a walkout in my elementary school, 17 minutes for the 17 students and faculty members who were killed in the school shooting in Parkland, Florida. That's what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about gun violence and how it affected me. After giving my speech at the March for Our Lives, or rather while during writing my speech for the March for Our Lives, I realized that gun violence wasn't a problem that affected me and that I couldn't authentically speak on something that I haven't experienced. And so I began to think about what I had experienced, and the am answer was pretty clear. Living every day in the skin as a black woman, being told that I am less than, and being told that I am no more than the stereotypical angry black disrespectful girl. And so I really like lifting and raising the voices of girls of color, as B said, because I feel that we don't get as much attention. I think it's very noticed that a lot of the black activists in this community don't get a lot of recognition um, because the media glorifies people other than us. And so I just like to bring light to that issue. Thank you. Maxime? Yes. Um, so I started um, being an activist and being engaged um, a few years ago. Um, it all started with, um, with the climate issue. And I organized a few demonstrations and manifestations in my hometown. Um, and then I had to meet with, with politicians. And I could see how the situation was, was blocked and how it was difficult for us from the streets to, to have an impact on the real decisions. And so since last July, I represent the Swiss youth at the United Nations. Um, it's an opportunity given by the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs and the Swiss National Youth Council. And so I chose to take that institutional path to, to share my concerns, my ideas, to exchange with youth and to seek for an impact in Switzerland and also on international level. And currently I'm working on different projects. Um, so I, I co-founded co an NGO um, two months ago um, to break the cycle of stigma around mental health issues. And I'm also working on a project, a think tank, to, to have a philosophical and ethical um, analysis of political decisions. Thank you very much. Autumn? Um, so my name is Autumn Pelche. I am 15 years old and I am from Wakamakonga Mantuan Island, which is located in um, Ontario, Canada. And I currently live in Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada. Um, so basically how I started my work, um, I was eight years old and I decided to speak up for my people, uh, which is the indigenous peoples of Canada. And a lot of those, um, a lot of communities in, in Canada are suffering from um, ac zero access to clean drinking water. So I, as, a, um, as an eight year old, I guess, I don't, know like, I don't know exactly why it triggered me, but it triggered me to speak up for those communities. and. Ever since then, I've been actively working with a lot of different companies, industries, um, a lot of different people. So that's kind of how I got to where I am. Thank you. Micah? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael White. So I actually started doing activism when I was 13 years old. It's, so it's, I, it's all I've ever done my entire life. And um, I have, throughout my life, various campaigns at various ages have like 
reached certain peaks. So when I was 13, I started doing activism. But when I was 17, I created a campaign that got onto national television. And then when I was 28, we did, you know, co-created Occupy Wall Street. Um, so in terms of what I'm working on now, I think one of the things that's the most pressing issue, obviously, um, is climate change and, and the need for an unprecedented uh, mobilization. The largest, probably the largest mobilization on human history has to take place in the next, within the next 10 years. And we have to accomplish monumental tasks like planting one trillion trees. Um, and so I'm in Davos to really talk about the, the real challenge of creating a mobilization of that scale and how activists are probably the only social group that, from which a mobilization of that kind could come from. Yet at the same time, we also need the support of industry and governments because those are the key players in deciding whether or not protests will be suppressed and squashed or allowed to grow large. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. And now, Micah, being probably the most experienced person on today's panel, what advice would you give to youth trying to make a change but who don't necessarily have the platform to make a change or who don't know how to get started? <laughs> um, you know, it's hard to give advice because I think the thing about um, activism and the creation of social movements is that there is no formula. So I think that my advice would be that um, you really can't follow anyone's advice. Like what I have done in my life is I've developed a kind of intuition about what I think will work and then I test it out, I see what happens and then I develop a new theory. But I'll tell you one thing that I think is important to keep in mind as a young person is that before every single campaign, when I would tell people the idea for it, they always told me it was a bad idea, across the board. So I'm in Davos, like everyone's telling me it's a horrible idea that I'm here. Before Occupy Wall Street, horrible idea. So people, the thing is, is that people outside of you don't actually know whether or not your idea for a campaign will take off. And it takes a tremendous amount of fortitude as a young person to say, I'm just going to do it anyways and see what happens. So it's, it's very, that's, I think, the most important rule. Yeah. And so you mentioned outside of the youth. You never know if it's going to work. The three of you being youth, we grew up a lot more with technology and things like social media. Do you think social media has been a tool that's helped us have more youth activists or spread the word easier? Naomi, if you want to start us off. I think that social media has been a great resource for people who don't maybe live in a small town and they can't reach a lot of people um, by traveling and stuff. So if you're able to post something or tweet about something that you believe in and then you have access to thousands of people, I think that could be a really helpful resource. But at the same time, not everybody has access to the internet or access to technology of that kind. And so I feel like there, there could be other ways where we could spread messages and um, provide resources for people who don't have them. Yeah. Autumn, what do you think? Um, well, I think that social media is actually a really good way to be spreading like the message, our messages through the youth because a lot of the youth are actually on social media. A lot of us have phones and that's how a lot, a lot of um, our messages get across. So I think that has a really big impact on the stuff we do. And now, Maxime, you're also, so you're studying law, so you see it also from a more legal perspective. Social media helps us spread the word, but do you think that um, we should use policy making as a tool? But like, do you think youth activists sorry, should, you, should use policy making as a tool in order to further their movements? Yes, definitely. Um, what we could hear from the streets in Switzerland in the last few months, in the last few years, the many climate action was really good. I really support it. But we cannot expect these actions from, from, from other people. We have to we have to be the one making decisions. And so to anyone who's here, who's listening here, I would like to, to invite you to, to enroll a party, to, to submit an initiative, to, to use the tools we have. Um, I was speaking with a Swiss perspective where, where it is really easy for, for anyone to, to participate in the legislative process. And so we have these this great opportunity here to, to be directly involved. And I would like, really, I would really like to, to see youth um, using, using those tools to, to create change. And now, you live in, the, the rest of you live in um, America and Canada where the, you might, the youth might not have as much voting power in the sense that, you know, Switzerland being a direct democracy, there's a lot of referendums, you can vote a lot easier for what you believe in. What would you say to, what, well, what advice would you give to youth who don't feel they have that political power in terms of what their vote means? How could they make a change? Micah, do you want to? Well, I mean, I, I think it's a good question. I mean, I think that the thing to keep in mind, though, is that 
the nature of power is really changing. So one of the really fundamental shifts I think that's happening right now with the nature of power is that you know, it's no longer sufficient just to be the most materially powerful or the, or the wealthiest. You also need this capacity to mobilize the citizenry. And, the, and the one way they're calling it is like a power and outcome. You need to be able to, to mobilize people. That's one of the, the core aspects of power, to, power today. And I think that that capacity to mobilize people is what activists excel at. And so in many ways, even though it feels like you don't have power, you actually are the only, you, you have this, this unique ability. It's not easy, but you do have a unique ability as a youth or just as an outsider to, to spark a social movement or to spark a social protest. And that capacity, I think, um, is integral to the new functioning of power. So I, I, what I see happening is that activism is being integrated more deeply into the functioning of power and to elite circles, which is, I mean, which is why we're here. It's, it's very strange that Occupy Wall Street would be here, you know, in this sense. But there, there is something about the capacity to mobilize people that elites are very curious about and very much want to learn about. And I think what I would say to youth is that they can't steal that power from us. They don't have the ability to steal it. They're going to have to work with us in this, in this endeavor. So it's, it's interesting. And you say we don't have the power to steal it, but now there's been a lot of debate about the voting age and maybe decreasing the voting age to, let's say, 16. What would be your opinion on that? And I'm, not, I'm going to ask the young ones next to see what you guys think of it. Do you think yeah. the voting age should be decreased? Well, look, I think that you know, absolutely, if, you, if you'd asked me that two years ago, I'd say absolutely. The goal of all activism, I would say, is about the capture of sovereignty, the capture of political power, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that we've entered into a whole new situation right now with the climate emergency. Like, we basically have 10 years in order to, they're saying that scientists say we have to reduce carbon emissions 7.6% per year each year for 10 years. It's a completely, practically impossible goal. And I think in light of that, it really calls into questions about what our priorities are. Mm -hmm. So like, you could spend the next 10 years trying to lower the voting age to 16, and we all die because of climate change. I mean, to put it into stark terms. So I think that it's, that's the real challenge for activists right now, is to, to figure out what are our priorities. Do we still pursue the things that we used to want to pursue, like political power? Or are we really just like doubling down on climate mobilization? Now, Naomi, you don't have political, you can't vote yet. And same with Autumn. What, what's your perspective on it? Do you think that we should decrease the voting age? I feel that if we lower the voting age to 16, we should make sure that the 16-year-olds are educated. Because if we have a bunch of 16-year-olds who don't know what they're talking about, and we give them the power to vote, what is that going to do? Who's that going to put in office? I mean, will they be voting because they really think that it's the right choice? Or will they be voting with their opinions swayed by their parents and the people around them? So I think that if we were to, we should make sure that we do a better job at incorporating um, the science of politics and really how everything works into the school, um, into school's curriculums so that it's not just something that you might not know anything about and then go out to cast your ballot and not know what you're yeah. doing. I agree, I agree a lot with what Naomi just said. Um, my opinion on that would also be that um, I do feel in a way that maybe 16 would be a good voting age because um, really what the politicians are doing, um, they're making decisions in which is going to affect our future. And the decisions they make today, like I said, is going to affect our future. And I just feel like we should have a say in what happens. And yeah, that's really it. And now you brought up education and how if we're going to lower the voting age, we should reform education. You work with certain NGOs and you look at things like education. How would you go about helping educate, educating kids on youth activism? Maxime, sir. So that is a really important, important, important question. Um, I think we have to, to rethink our educational system um, for today's world. And we have to integrate um, soft skills such as leadership, teamwork, um, and others um, to the curriculum to, to really prepare young, young people to, to, to be in position and in further years to give them access to to platforms which make it which make it possible for them to 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 be socially committed and that goes through empowerment it goes through um, sharing of knowledge it also goes through um, proposing tools and that is really something I would like to to see in the next few years um, coming from from the schools, really preparing young young people to to make their own decisions and to create their own impact. Thank you. And now, 
you mentioned, wait, sorry. Um, you bring up so education and that being a barrier, it's so, somewhat of a barrier to youth activism because a lot of people aren't educated on the issues or they don't know how to start that. But another barrier that we also hear a lot about is age. Autumn and Naomi, you guys are the youngest here, 15 and 13 years old. How has age affected your ability to be a youth activist? Autumn, if you want to start us off. Well, for me, I started like speaking on bigger, larger platforms when I was about 10 years old. And I did get a lot of criticism for my age because I was speaking to a lot of higher level people, like politicians, and it was more specifically in Canada. And I think, well, in Canada, there's a lot of um, indigenous racism, and it's it was really hard being a young um, indigenous girl. And the the types of comments I would get was like, was, uh, for example, she's too young. What what can she do? Her opinion doesn't matter. She's only ten years old, or she's only twelve years old. And so, th I I didn't let that stop me though. And I think that does have a really big impact on what people persuade and think of us. And also, for another example, when I was 12 years old, I told off the Prime Minister of Canada, and I just felt that was a really um, got a good opportunity for me to express my feelings and express that a 12-year-old can do a lot bigger things than they say. So. Um, so yesterday in the car, actually one of the shuttles, um, a couple walked in, and they um, the, a man started saying that he thought that Trump did a really good job. Um, during his speech yesterday, and I, I, I'd like to say that my mom and I politely disagreed, mm -hmm. and so we we started discussing because, of course, you want to be able to have conversations yeah. with people who don't think the same as you without getting angry, um, and so we were talking about it, and it was relatively okay until they started talking about me like I wasn't there. Um, towards my mother and told my mother that maybe I wouldn't be able to fully comprehend what they were saying. And so I just, I got a little upset. Um, I think it's okay that I got upset because um, they were telling me, a woman of color, an immigrant who comes from the United States, what to think about my president. Um, and so I got upset and they were telling me how I, how I should think and telling me that I should have an open mind and I told them that I could handle myself but that I appreciated the input. Um, <laughs> and so I think that's just an, uh, an example, something that just happened yesterday about how age is always a barrier, I think especially for me because I was 12, 11, 12, 13 when I started and so I shouldn't know what I'm talking about and I shouldn't be able to clap back in that way and I think I might have been a little rude, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> and Micah, I'd love to get your perspective on this. As someone who started being an activist quite young and who's grown through it, how has your perspective on youth activism changed as your age changed? Yeah. Look, I'll be honest with you. I think that being young is a blessing and a curse. So. On the one hand, as, we, as, as we've seen, the youth have a kind of fearlessness, right? You have a fearlessness that you will do things when you are young that you will think twice about when you have, I have children. So the idea, for example, the idea of getting arrested and going to jail as an activist means something different because I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old at home than it did when I was 17, 18 years old. It didn't bother me as much. So on the one hand, you're fearless, which is a great asset for being an activist. You want to be fearless in order to do activism. A lot of, act a lot about, a lot of the nature of activism is losing your fear. But on the other hand, you know, I can just tell you as now that I'm in my almost, I'm like 37, I've been doing activism now for, geez, a long time. The difference, the weakness of youth is a, is a lack of historical understanding. I mean, just speaking for myself, I will tell you honestly, I don't think I read a history book until I was 19 years old, 20 years old. Like I just, you completely lack a historical understanding of what has come before you and, and that's a good thing and a bad thing. So I think, I think that what I would say is like, at each stage of your development as an activist, you have to uh, push the furthest for that stage. So like if you're, if you're young and you're fearless, be as fearless as you can. And when you get a little bit, like a little bit older, like dive as much into history as you can. But basically like, um, yeah, it, 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 it's a blessing and a curse. And I'd like to go back to something Naomi said. You said, you know, we should be allowed to start a conversation about, you know, the couple in the shuttle yesterday. Maxime, how would you go about helping people start that conversation? 
because it's not always an easy conversation to start, whether it be about climate change or political opinions, et cetera. How would you go about helping youth start those conversations? Young people, you mean? Yeah. Um, I mean, first, we should address these issues at school, which is the basis for, for every young for every young guy or every young girl. And we should really talk about these subjects because <coughs> they matter a lot. And often, um, we, we sometimes lack of knowledge about, this, about these subjects. And so bringing these subjects at school um, really helps to, to have a good knowledge about it. And then to have the opportunity to have good arguments if we want to, to address them to political leaders and not only to, to reclaim our voice because we're young, but also because we know about it. Thank you. And Autumn, you started that conversation, but you mentioned how being indigenous, you received a lot of backlash for it. How were you able to overcome many of the challenges that came with being a First Nation person? Well, like I said, there's a lot of indigenous racism in Canada, and really what I did was I mainly ignored it because it didn't really matter to me, and I did have a main focus, which was to get my message out. So I never focused on the negativity people were um, pushing towards me, and I just kept on going and just kept on trying to spread my message, and it got me through, and I'm still here. I'm still doing my work, so. And Naomi, how do you deal with it? Because I'm assuming you also receive a lot of backlash for your activism. Yeah, um, I actually tweeted something yesterday about an article that I disagreed with, and somebody told me to go um, to tell my parents to get me a psychiatrist because I was clearly filled with rage. Um, and I, of course, it's a little upsetting, but it's kind of laughable at this point because it's not my fault that you that the truth makes you uncomfortable. It's not my fault that you didn't grow up in a household where you talked about issues. I mean. Your uncomfort is not my issue, so it's really, you're, you can do whatever you want, I really don't care. <laughs> but I mean, I was also asked what I would like to say to certain politicians who I didn't agree with, what I would say to change their minds, and how I would um, like to see change in that aspect. But there's, if you can't change their minds, you should elect new people, because there's really no point in trying to educate ignorance when they're already set in their beliefs. And that ties in nicely to my, that t ties in nicely, sorry, to my next question, which would be, in today's political climate, especially in America where there's a lot of disagreement, how has that affected being a youth activist? Or how has that affected the youth's ability to create change? Mike, I guess you've kind of grown through it. How would? Well, I mean, I, I think one thing I would say that's really interesting and really hard is like, like, so my first campaign that got national prominence was in 1999. In 1999, I created this campaign I wrote an article for the New York Times, and I was on uh, Bill Maher's Politically Incorrect, which was like on millions of homes or something like that. But there was no Twitter, Facebook, or any of that. So the feedback, the negativity that I got was just like in lo my local community, right? Fast, go to, go to today, you write an article like what we just heard, you get people on the internet, trolls, whatever, like all over the world sending you negativity. So I think that, that there is something that you have to, it's, even I'm affected by that, you know what I mean? So it's like, there is something about the, the kind of um, conflicts that are emerging in our society that's being amplified by the ability for someone like a thousand miles away to send you hate on the internet, which is good, which requires youth activists to build an even thicker skin than I think I had to have as a 17 year old. I mean, I just had to deal with people on the street saying something. Now you have to deal with people, you know, like all the way in like another country saying something. So it's, I think that's a real, it's a real challenge. Um, and it's, so I, I mean, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to kind of like protect um, our psyche from that very damaging, yeah. And you've discussed writing articles, and you actually wrote an article recently about how Davos was reputational suicide for an activist. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I mean, look, look, I was almost arrested in 2002 uh, in an anarchist protest against the World Economic Forum, which that year was meeting in New York City. I was in the streets uh, blocking traffic against the very organization that I am in right now. And so activism, and activism has a culture. Um, and the culture of activism that I'm a part of, that I've been a part of my entire life, is that this is an irredeemably evil space. 
filled with elites who have caused the problems of this world and who will be unable to create solutions to those problems. So to break with that tradition and say that, well, I think the climate emergency changes the nature of the, of the um, basically, the solution to the climate emergency is going to involve these people here. There's just, there's no way around, like for example, planting one trillion trees. There's no way to plant one trillion trees without the resources of industry and government and out the, without their tacit approval. There's just no way to do it, right? So we can protest in the streets and we can do that for the, environmentalism has been doing that for 40 years. We can keep doing that until we fail. So it, it, what, it is reputational suicide. You have to, as an activist, you, you constantly have to break with the orthodoxy of activism. The industry of activism, you have to break with it in order to be uh, effective. Like I said, when I told people about the idea for Occupy Wall Street, everyone, including activists, told me it was a bad idea. So if you listen to the orthodoxy of activism, um, you will just end up repeating the same mistakes that we're all that is going on. It's very difficult. Now I want to come back to this, but first, you've mentioned a couple of times how we well, have to work with the industry in order to see meaningful change, and activism by itself, it's harder to achieve meaningful change. Maxime, you kind of, you see, I don't want to say you see both because you don't work in the industry, but working with NGOs and stuff, you probably have more access. Do you think, how do you think working with industries, like activists and industry working together can help create more change than they are individually? I mean, now we have a new paradigm um, where industry, industries play a huge role in a lot of topics. Um, that a lot of young people are committed to. If we think about climate change, um, human rights, uh, women's rights, or whatever, um, all these subjects are connected with, with the impact these industries have. And so if we want to change this, if we want to change the way industry works, then we have to be the one directing them. We have to be the CEOs. And we cannot, I'm repeating myself of what I said before, but we cannot expect these actions from other people. We have to do them by, by ourselves. And for this reason, we have to, we have to create startups. We have to, we have to be bosses. And that's really an ambition I would like to share with you. I would really want to see every one of you seeking for these top positions, these top leadership positions that enabled you to make these changes. Thank you. And I think speaking of startups and industries, there's a whole lot of talk right now, and there has been for quite a while, about how there's a lot of gender inequality in a lot of the industries. And I was wondering, to what extent does gender affect your ability to precipitate change as a youth activist, where everyone sh should theoretically be so accepting? Naomi, would you? Yeah. So. I think that it's harder for women of color in general because we are women and we are um, not white, which is two things stacked against us. And I feel like that's two stereotypes and two boundaries that you have to break through. And so it's definitely harder as an immigrant. I feel um, especially affected when people are speaking um, not being the most educated on issues regarding immigration um, and people with refugee status. And so I feel that it's, it's harder. And the activist community is um, a place that is supposed to be very accepting, like you said. But I have had experiences where I am the cute little black girl who can like help us get the adults to like us, you know? And so it's just, it's bad, but I've distanced myself from those people. And I feel like we really should be practicing what we preach. So we want to be accepting and we want to accept everybody. So we should do that instead of just accepting the people who we think are acceptable. Autumn, what do you think? Well, it's also similar to, again, it's a, yeah. lo a lot similar to what um, Naomi did, did say. And being an indigenous person in Canada, like I said, uh, like again, um, there's indigenous racism in Canada. And um, I do find it harder because even before she mentioned how you see on the media, it's all, uh, the majority of it is people of, that, um, people of non, non-color, I guess you could say, and you don't see a lot of um, the girls with color, and I think we should be paid a lot more attention to because a lot of us do have, like, ba like culture backgrounds, and we have a lot of different perspectives, and we come from a lot of different perspectives, and when, even when I talk, I talk about, I talk about the work I do and the stuff going on 
from an indigenous perspective. And so I just think it has a, not a lot more meaning, but it has a different type of meaning. And um, yeah, that's really it. So elaborating on what Autumn said, when we think about the most prominent faces of activism today, um, youth activists, probably not a lot of them are black women or women of color in general. And of course, and it's, and it's, it's hard to watch as the media glorifies um, people who might not um, just because they have a message and they have white skin, so therefore their message is more valuable. And so I feel that um, the women um, of color have been at the forefront of every major movement in the United States, but we don't know their names and we don't know their stories, and I feel that we should. And we should be um, acknowledging them and we should be paying tribute so that they're not just statistics and they're not just numbers, but they're actual people. I mean, it's also not um, those activists' fault. It's the media that glorifies them and makes them out to be um, the pioneers of every movement when they weren't. Not anything against those people, but there are a lot more people um, behind them and in front of them. And so when we only focus on one person and we only use a couple people as the example, it's not really um, true to what we believe. And having heard that, we're here in Davos today where this, I mean, this session alone, little, like, including all the others that are happening, but especially this one, are being very publicized. You can go online, find the session, rewatch it, etc. So going back to Micah, you saying how Davos was reputational suicide, having heard what these girls have to say, why is it important that activists like you are here in Davos today to address all these issues? Well, look, I mean, I think I want to answer that question by bringing some nuance to this idea of working with, OK? So I think that activists are rightly so to be skeptical, skeptical of working with, working with elites, because oftentimes the terms of uh, to work with elites oftentimes means that you have to give away the thing that makes you an activist, the revolutionary edge that makes you an activist. And so I think that what I'm trying to say is that we can, we need to, uh, I, I'm using the terminology of like a united front. A united front is when people who are adversaries work together on a greater goal without, without trying to get rid of their differences. So I think that it's, I think it's, I think it is very important to, to um, work with the people, the elites at Davos, but you also have to not give up the very thing that, that makes us powerful as activists, which is our ability, our adversity. You know, our adversity is what makes us strong as activists. Our hunger makes us strong as activists. You know, the reason why I came up in collaboration with another person, the idea for Occupy Wall Street, is because I was hungry. I wasn't making any money. I wasn't, you know what I mean? I'm, and, I'm, and I'm still hungry. I'm still, so like, I think that it's important not to, to think that working with means playing nice and being, being the way they are. Working with means maintaining your edge, but figuring out a way to, to find some sort of common cause together. So it's absolutely important in the next 10 years to figure out how we're going to do this massive climate mobilization, while at the same time understanding that if we give up the very thing that makes us activists, then we will never create the mobilization. So it's not, it's not a question of just trying to mimic them. It's a question of maintaining our difference from them. Now, you mentioned um, the Occupy Wall Street movement. and. Recently, you've come to call it a constructive failure. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I think it's very important as activists to constantly assess our theories of change, right? So the, the dominant story of change that's been floated since basically the civil rights movement in America is that when large numbers of people get into the streets and with a, with a unified demand, largely nonviolent, and present that demand to their elected representatives, then change will have to happen. And I think with Occupy Wall Street, that's precisely what we did. That's, what I, that's the dream I had been chasing for all those years as an activist, and that's what we created. It spread to 82 countries, 1,000 cities. Um, it was largely nonviolent, et cetera, et cetera. But they, they didn't. The change that we wanted didn't happen. So I think it's also very important as activists to, to not succumb to the naive notion that our representatives have to listen to us if we mobilize enough people in the streets. It's actually not true anymore. It may have been true in the past, but I think it's not true anymore. They, there's a, there is an agreement in the West now that um, mass mobilizations in the streets don't need to be listened to. It, it was true under Obama, and it's even more true under Trump. So I think it's very, the reason I call it a constructive failure is because it, it failed, but in failing, it revealed something very important for activists about activist strategy and the future of activist strategy. So I, I just think it's very important for activists to constantly test the boundaries and assess why it didn't get there and try something new. It's, it's crucial. And so you say sometimes that movements, like being in the street, doesn't always achieve what people want it to achieve. You girls are activists. 
what do you what would you say is the biggest barrier to you I think having meaning well, you're, you're you're are creating change but you know going the extra step and really achieving what you want to achieve I think that mass mobilization and marching in the streets can have an impact if it's not just a surface gesture if you're not um, if you're just protesting and you're just holding up signs and taking pictures and tweeting about it, um, even if there's hundreds of thousands of people there, you're not going to do anything. So I do disagree, but I agree to a certain extent. But however, um, I think what movements should be and I think what protests should be is getting people to become politically active um, and have people register to vote so that it's not only 100,000 people, it's 100,000 people who are going to exercise their right to vote. And when they exercise their right to vote, they can then elect the people who they think is right for office. And so just being able to... Um, do something more than just standing in the street, um, I feel like it could work. And it's not, if it doesn't work, you're not doing it right. Or they could even be the ones uh, running for office. Hmm? Or they could even be the one running for office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Maxime, you offer the idea of running for office. Do you think we're going to see a surge of youth running for office because we do see a lot of young politicians but not many of them make it to many positions of power in political systems. <coughs> do you think we're going to be more successful in the future, I guess, would be my question. I hope so. So last October we had uh, national elections in Switzerland and so in the last legislation um, the average age was 50.3 years old and now it's, now it's it's sink to 49. So it's, it's a small step, but I think we're on the right path. And we could see a lot of, a lot of young politicians um, being elected, the youngest being um, 25. And I think we have to, to share these stories to, to young people. We have to, to make them aware that, that running for, for an election is possible. Um, no matter if you're 18 or 60, and that you can be elected and that you can submit your ideas and your solutions. And that's also something um, I disagree with Micah. Um, I don't think activism um, should only seek for activism. I think they should seek for concrete impacts, um, for concrete actions, and also take position, take control of the decision-making process. How would you react to what Maxima said? Well, I would say everyone has to follow their revolutionary intuition. You know, I'm not like I said. Like I presented my ideas for campaigns, people would say no, and then I went ahead and did it, and whatever. But I, but I tell you what I personally believe is that yeah, I absolutely. If you read my writings after Occupy Wall Street, I pursued, I I, I advocated for electoral social movements that would win elections and gain power and all this kind of stuff. And I and I I, I would tell you today, I think that there's no time. I just don't think there's any time. I think that the climate, the, the, the 40 years of environmentalism has failed and left us with basically an impossible task. And we can either say, like a lot of people do believe we've already lost. We, so we could just say, well, we've, we've lost. We can move on to other things. Or we could say, OK, we have a one last chance, one last 10-year period, and there's no time for anything else. So, but I think that, again, I, I, I just don't think that, I don't think that activism is the kind of thing where you can tell someone else that they shouldn't pursue the direction that they want to go. So I would say, you go your way, and I'll tell you what I think we should do, and we'll each try. Like, everyone has to basically try what they believe. That's the only way to go about it, so. And I guess kind of leading into the idea of going your own way, well, Autumn and Naomi, again, ties into you two. Um, you both, it, the movement started, kind of started from you. you it, it wasn't your parents really motivating you, right, if I'm correct. It was you guys who wanted to make a change. How did your family react to that? And how did they support you in you actually becoming a youth activist? So in my household growing up, politi um, politics was always on the news. We always were hearing the president's speech. I mean, we were very aware of what was going on politically and what was going on um, in the activist world and in general around the world. And so I feel very lucky to be able to um, live in a household where I'm educated on the issues that's happening and even though a lot of that education would it would be beneficial if it came from school I think it's also very important to have real-life conversations about it and not just take tests and listen to lectures on it um, and so I feel like that kind of conversation has always been take 
uh, has always taken place in my household, but um, I know some of my friends, um, some other people, they don't know anything that's happening, and their parents have sheltered them because they want to protect them. They don't think it's important for them to know. They don't think they should have to deal with that. And so I think that all parents should be te teaching their children and exposing their children to what's going on, because I feel when you don't, you're going to have a child who grows up thinking that everything is going to go according to them, and when it doesn't, there's going to be a problem. Autumn, what about you? Well, for me, um, it was it was both my own inspiration and, um, and inspiration from one of my mentors. And really where my own inspiration came from was I was eight years old and an hour from my community where I used to live on Manitoulin Island, which is also the, uh, the largest freshwater island in the world, um, only an hour from there, there was a, there was a First Nations community that was on a boil water advisory for 20 years. So they weren't able to drink their water for 20 years. And there's children growing up not knowing what it's like to drink clean water from a tap. And so I didn't know that before, prior to when I was going there. And I, I went to the washroom and of course, I'm used to being able to do all those normal things. And on the walls, there were signs that said, don't drink the water, don't, don't use the water, um, not for consumption. And so I didn't know what any of that meant. And so I got back and I asked my mom, what does all that mean? And she explained to me what the boil wa the, that the community was on a boil water advisory and what it was. And so that's kind of where my first inspiration came from. And also prior to that, my Auntie Josephine, she recently passed away, but she was, she, she was doing the work that I'm doing right now. And um, she, she's, uh, it's really hard for me to talk about her, so if I start crying, I'm sorry. But, um, yeah, I think it's coming. <laughs> I'm sorry. We can move on to someone else, and I'll come back to you. Don't worry. Um, now, Micah, I want to ask you about your perspective on today's movements that we see. Having seen Occupy being a constructive failure, what do you think of movements like Black Lives Matter or March for Our Lives, Fridays for Future, that are gaining a lot of media, you know, media presence, and they're on social media everywhere? Do you think they're achieving what they set out to achieve? Well, you know, um, I think that, look, I think that we have to move towards a outcome-based activism. No. Um, move towards outcome-based activism, which means assessing activism based on the um, outcomes that it has, right? And so, you know, my assessment of contemporary movements is that we're in a very, it's a very difficult, it's a very tricky time to be an activist because there are, there are social forces that want to amplify activism and remove the power of activism at the same time. Um, so, yeah, it's Thank very, you. yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't really. No, I don't want to keep. I yeah, I feel really just, bad talking. <laughs> you know, um, I don't want to talk over the memory of your, um, your aunt, but um, yeah. Well, now I'm a little, I'm a little lost, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, I think a question I really want to ask, like to, I guess, something to empower the audience, since we're coming towards the end of our discussion, is what motivated you in the first place to do what you're doing today? And I think it's, we'll go down the line and kind of hear from everyone. Why did you start doing what you do? Um, the pain that I had felt my entire life as a girl of color growing up in Virginia, I think that I was angry and I wanted to do something with all the tension that was co coursing through my body and I wanted to be able to say something and I wanted to be able to put all of that negativity into a positive place. And so a lot of the motivation for me came from um, all of that energy and all of that tension that I had built up inside me. But I worked my best, I tried my best to channel it into positive energy and channel it into motivation. So it wasn't just me sitting around feeling sorry for myself, but it was me working so that no other girls have to feel that way. Maxime? Um, so when I was 15 years old, um, I was, I was really asking myself uh, many questions and I wanted to be socially committed to, to work for causes I believed in. And maybe um, not like the other panelists, I didn't have one specific topic I wanted to defend. It was more an engagement I wanted to have. And so 
I started to to do this uh, step by step, and from what I I could talk with a long, lot of young people, this is this is a feeling that 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 is shared, and a lot of a lot of young people want to want to be engaged and want to to have an impact, but often they don't know how. So, if I can share a piece of advice with everyone who who shares the feeling I had. Um, do believe in your dreams and put 200% efforts in it. Because if you don't believe yourself in your dreams, then no one else will. And yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to share. And that's also what, what motivated me in the first place. So I could probably go back to what I was saying. But um, so yeah, after learning about what a boil water advisory was, um, it was kind of, no actually after that I learned that um, that obviously was not the only community in Canada um, that um, is under a boil water advisory, and then I learned that there was a hundred over a hundred boil water advisories in Canada and forty in Ontario alone, and so that was kind of it was concerning to me. I know I was only eight years old, but it meant something to me and. Um, and then just having to think that there was kids my age and even younger that grew up not knowing what it's like to drink water from a tap. And so even with that, my Auntie Josephine, um, she was the chief water commissioner and um, that's, what, that's my title now. So she, that title was handed down to me and that's basically what I do now is I, um, I, I sit at the decision table when decisions are made for the Great Lakes and um, I have a say in what happens and I advocate for them. And so, um, um, yeah, I think that's what I was <laughs> going to say. Thank you. And Micah? Yeah, I mean, look, I think about a lot why, why I ended up on this path. I think there's a, bio there's a biographical explanation, which is that, you know, my dad is African American, my mother is white, and I never fit in on either side, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think that really captures, like, why I became an activist. I think instead it's like I was born that way. I always, even the, I, I just always remember being fascinated with that. Um, I mean, I was probably predisposed because my parents were also like minor activists in college and stuff like that. But I think that what really ended up happening is that um, it became my way to escape my destiny. So without activism, I obviously wouldn't be here. And I can tell you for a fact where my brother ended up and where other people in, where the other people in my community, where they ended up. Um, and where I would have ended up without activism. So activism became my way to fight against the status quo that I was, that I was locked into and my way to propel myself out of that, out of that situation into new things. So, and then in the end, it, 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 you know, it opens some doors and it closes others. So at this point, it's closed a lot of doors. You know what I mean? Like I'm not going to get a job. I haven't never, I've never worked an actual job. The only job I've actually had was a, I worked for Adbusters Magazine, yeah. an anarchist anti-consumerist magazine. You know what I mean? So like, so so what it means is when I, if I were to apply for a job at like Facebook or something, I don't, I have no understanding of office culture whatsoever. You know what I mean? So there's, so there's things that that happen. So once you're, I'm I'm locked on this path. You know what I mean? It'll be forever. You say that, but at the same time, we were talking backstage, and you were saying how people told you like, oh, you're never gonna go to university. You're mm -hmm. never gonna get an education. Well, you know, you did that. You got a doctorate. Mm -hmm. You say you would never be able to get a job, but you have the educational training to do mm -hmm. so. So wouldn't you theoretically? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, anything is possible. What I'm saying is that it's a. There's a, What I'm saying is there's a certain there's certain personal um, character, characteristics that you have to develop in yourself to maintain yourself as an activist. I'll be honest with you. Most activists do not make it past the age of 25. Okay, it's very difficult to make a living as an activist, and there's a lot of social pressures to give up activism as you get older. It's easier when you're younger. It really is, um, and so. As you get older, it becomes harder and harder to maintain yourself as an activist. And the way you maintain yourself as an activist is by f strengthening certain characteristics that you have, which are um, not, don't play so nicely with corporate environments. That's all I would say. So I, I, so I give a lot of talks, and I've given talks at corporations so that I can, they bring me in for like one-day sessions. But the idea that I'm going like to suddenly switch gears and become you know, a VP of some, something, 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 I don't, I don't pursue that dream, and I don't think it's really a likely scenario. And I want to go back to Autumn, if that's OK with you. You talked about so how you never heard about the water issue in other communities around you. I think 
the general public, we've heard about like Flint, in Mich Flint, Michigan, for example, and their problem with water, not having ac access to cl clean water, and after all these years, still not having access to clean water. But we don't really hear a lot about the clean water issue in Canada. I mean, why is that, and what can we do to be more informed or even to help? Well, it is an ignored, I guess you could say it's an ignored issue in Canada. You don't hear a lot about it. Um, <coughs> I can't exactly say why it's ignored, but I feel like it's mainly because it's a lot of the remote communities. Like, you can't drive to the communities that, so, to a lot of the communities that have oil water, oil water advisories. And um, you have to fly there. And I actually was able to um, go to one, and it's almost like you're not in Canada when you go there. It's it lo it's totally different. And knowing that Canada is one of the richest countries and it's not a third world country, a lot of the communities are living in third world conditions. And I almost feel like that's why they're not paid attention to because it's it's really remote. It's nothing's really there, and I feel like that's also why. And um, yeah, that, I just that's that's what I feel like. That's why. Well, we only have time. First of all, thank you for your answer. And we only have time for one more question. So I want to you know, leave on a note of empowerment. You mentioned anger. And I'd like to ask all of you to give advice to someone who's feeling really angry, who has all this anger, doesn't know what to do with it, but wants to make a change. What would you say to that person? What advice would you give them? Naomi, I guess if we can start with you. Um, I agree with Micah in the sense that you shouldn't look to others for what you should do because it's kind of that whole individual aspect of activism that um, really makes us who we are. I feel that um, when I was struggling, I always, um, to figure out what I want to do, what I wanted to talk about, I would always look up videos of other activists and other girls and I would see what they were doing and I would try to mimic what they were doing. But what's really important is doing what makes you happy. And so I feel that we shouldn't look to others. You shouldn't look to others for your definition of success, but you should look within yourself. If you want to be successful, do whatever your gut tells you to. If you want to put up posters because you want to educate the kids in your school, you can do that. If you want to write a blog, do that. If you want to give a speech, do that. Really, whatever you feel will have the biggest impact, whatever is the best fit for you, whatever you're most comfortable doing is what you should do. Thank you. Maxime? Um, I would like, um, I think you should first consider, so if you're have hunger and stuff. You should first consider what makes you unique and what makes your position unique, and <clears throat> how is your relation with the topic that makes you angry. And then um, you need perseverance and determination. Um, I mean, we can mention Greta Thunberg. Uh, she's been standing in front of the parliament for I don't know how many weeks, but she's not giving up, and that is a great example in that sense. Um, so if you, if you have this seek for change, do not give up and be totally committed to that. And yeah, that's the advice I would, I would give. Thank you. Autumn? I think what I would probably say is that anyone has the capability to be doing what we're, we're doing up here. And for me, mine really came from passion and inspiration. And so I think it's just really what you believe in. And also my Auntie Josephine also did have a quote she always used, and it was, just do it. Like, <laughs> and um, so like anyone, anybody would go up to her and say like, oh, I had this dream, and this is what we were doing. Should I do it? And then she wouldn't even say anything else. She would just tell them, just do it. So I, I was going to kind of relate to that and say, if you, if you have an idea or a way you can help, just do it. So that's really my advice. Thank you. And last but not least, Micah? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, so I think the greatest danger to activists in terms of continuing their activism is burnout, right? Burnout is very difficult because one thing that you learn as an activist is that the status quo is, is so resilient. You can, you can punch the status quo so hard. I had, I really believed that Occupy Wall Street was going to, I, I thought Obama would have to step down. I mean, it's, it's hard because people don't really remember those times, but there's millions of people in the street protest. So what I'm saying is you have to hit the status quo so hard, and then when it, the status quo doesn't move, it's easy to get burned out. So I'll give you the, the antidote to burnout, because I've never I've been able to survive without burnout. The antidote to burnout is that the history of revolution teaches us that social movements and revolutionary moments tend to come when they are least expected. So right before Occupy Wall Street, we asked some leading activists, could something like the Arab Spring happen in America? 
And they all said no. And then Occupy Wall Street ha happened one month later. So whenever I'm feeling despair or burnout, then I remind myself, well, that's precisely the moment in which these social movements tend to arise. Thank you all so much for your well, profound, empowering comments. We're now going to be having a Q&A session with you, the audience. So I just, there's going to be some roaming mics. Um, if you have a question and a mic makes its way to you, please stand up, say your name, and then, and then ask your question. We won't be taking comments just for the sake of time. So make sure it's a question, and please keep it brief. Thank you. So are there any questions? You could just raise your hand. Hello, everyone. My name is Angelina Bright. I'm from Washington State. And this question is for Micah. When you stay up late at night thinking, what is your best strategy to stop the Koch brothers? <laughs> <laughs> because they're not responsive to mobilization in the streets, yeah. posters, blogs. Yeah. Um, and I completely agree with you that climate change and mobility at this point is an emergency yeah. and a crisis. I mean, it's a tough question because I think what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that um, I would like to ignore and bypass all those forces and focus on the climate mobilization. I think the only forces that need to be directly confronted are the ones who are standing in the way and opposing. So I think that like, if they can maintain a kind of neutrality, for, I mean, Trump just endorsed the Trillion Tree campaign. I'm all about the Trillion Tree campaign. I've been talking about the Trillion Tree campaign for like nine, nine months. You know, I, first, it's a great campaign. So like, if Trump's on board and the Koch brothers want to step aside and whatever, fine, they can continue to exist. I think that we need to like, get away from, because it's a distraction. What I'm saying is we don't have much time. So, I, and I think, but then I think if they start to stand in the way, then fine, we need to figure out how to like, get rid of them or whatever. But I would just say, like, let's just like, put our blinders on. I know they're, they're their existence annoys us, but let's just like, ignore them, move forward, and, do, and try to get this mobilization off the ground, and work with whoever is willing to get it off the ground. Everybody, my name is Sabrina Davis. I'm from Washington, DC, and I'm an activist as well. And I understand when you have burnout or you come up against frustrations. And so my question is for the other three. You explain what you do, Micah. But what do you do when you hit a wall? You get discouraged. Um, what is your advice to other folks when they hit that wall? Because it's inevitable and constant, and you just have to fight through it. Um, what I do when I feel um, unmotivated and tired, um, I take a break. Because I think that a lot of what activists do is they're so busy trying to save the world and trying to advocate for other people that they forget to take care of themselves. And so self-care and caring for yourself, maybe journaling, thats it sounds really cliche, but it's really important because I, I found myself feeling really badly about myself and about the work that I do because I might not have been um, making the, having the impact that I wanted to have. But that's not my fault and it's not anybody else's fault. And so we really need to take care of ourselves before we try to take care of other people, which I think is sometimes hard to realize when you are an activist. Um, I totally agree with, with what you just said. Um, a few months back, I had 10 projects I wanted to launch, um, 10 ideas growing in my mind. And I had my studies, I had to focus on that. And besides, my mind was overwhelmed with all these ideas. and. I reached a bad position, and so, oh, sorry. <laughs> so it's really important, like you say, to, to take care of yourself first and to, to put boundaries um, to protect your own personal life. Alden? Um, well, for me, even from past experience, I went through really bad bullying because of the stuff I was doing. and. My community wasn't necessarily small, but it was, there was, in, the, in my community there's 4,000 people, and this was when I was in grade six, which I was 12 years old, and um, I was facing a lot of bullying, and you always hear like, don't let, don't let them get to you, don't let, just, oh, just ignore it. But it's really hard, and what I really, it really did, it did get to me, and the, but then one day it really clicked for me, and I had to think, wow, I'm actually letting them get to me. I'm actually like listening to what they're saying. It's actually bothering me. But, and then I was forgetting about why I was doing what I was doing. And I was forgetting the whole purpose. And so I had to really remind myself to just ignore them. Like uh, an opinion's an opinion. Of course, everyone, everyone's going to have opinions, whether it's negative or positive. And so I've just really learned to really just not care what people say. 
And so I, that's really my own, my, probably my advice is just not caring what people say. Thank you. Do we have any more questions in the audience? Um, hi, I'm Olivia. I'm 11 from Westport, Connecticut in the U.S. And my question is, how do you think that youth can help achieve, achieve the sustainable development goals for, to help our future? That's a good question. Does anyone want to tackle that? <laughs> I'm seeing, oh, yeah, you can. So, um, as you probably know, 17 goals were launched by the, by the United Nations. And so, through my personal experience, um, I attended different events um, presenting initiatives in all these movements, in all these <clears throat> topics. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that youth is, has, a special play, has a special role to play in the achievement of SDGs. Um, I think it's the job of, of everyone of policymakers, it, it, it's like a common duty, and not especially for youth, not only for youth. But on the other hand, um, we could use our creativity that we have as youth to, to develop strategies and solutions, um, products, startups that help concretely to, to achieve these goals. Thank you. Micah, I saw you nodding when she asked the question, and I honestly really want to hear what you have to say. So no, I was I was nodding because because you asked a question. It's so hard to ask a question, and I just, just I was just proud of you for asking a question in front of everyone. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay, um, do we have any more questions? I think there's one in the back over there. Thank you. So obviously, uh, sorry. Obviously, being young already in itself is very controversial, but do you think that having very polarized activists like Greta Thunberg, who's quite radical, do you think that it helps or that maybe it hinders and distracts from the work that they're trying to do? I think that it definitely helps. I think that Greta and so many other activists have inspired a lot of kids. Um, I think that she's shown a lot of people um, that it's possible. I mean, she's so resilient, um, as Maxime said, and I think that um, it's great having her as a role model. I think that we shouldn't only be looking to Greta, for example, but to a lot of other people, as I was talking about the diversity and who we look up to. So Greta is an amazing activist, she is, and she's doing more work than some most people I know. However, there are a lot of other kids who are doing great things, and so um, people always like ask the question, who inspires you besides Greta? But I think that, assuming that we are going to say Greta in the first place. So I think that we should expand and we should look at more um, kids who are doing more work and we should accept everybody and acknowledge everybody and not just be set on this one or a couple people, there are a couple of them, um, who we really think are better and who we think are um, the pioneers, as I said, to every movement. So I think that Greta has inspired me. She definitely has. But we should definitely look to some other examples. Thank you. Autumn, you were about to jump it's in like there. the same thing. Oh, OK. Yeah. Anyone else have anything to add before we take another question? I mean, if I could just add something small, it's like I think one of the basic um, mistakes that people make when they try to do activism is they think, well, my end goal is to create a mass movement. So I'll start with an idea that appeals to many people. That's like actually not true. I think that the, idea, the, the ideas that take off and spiral into mass movements are precisely the ones that come from the edge. And what you, what you tend to find is that the social organism gravitates towards the edge. The, the, I mean, Occupy Wall Street was an insane idea. It was insane. And the, and the, mar and the not marketing, but the, the messaging that we did around it was crazy, you know, if you look at the original poster and stuff like that. So I think that you don't have to, it's not about being divisive or not. I think it's about you want to pitch something from the edge of society, the edge of thought, and you will find, if it takes off, that people gravitate towards it. When you pitch to the middle, um, it tends to just kind of fizzle. And this is why a lot of the um, focus group type so, uh, social movements never take off. Because it, it seems like a good idea everyone can agree on, but it doesn't excite people. Social movements take off because of how it makes people feel. Mm. So. 
Do we have any more questions? Hi, I'm uh, Luzan Ibawa from Germany. I have two questions, actually, if that's OK. One is rather a political one. In, in terms of the climate crisis, we face a new quality of crisis because we have such a short amount of time that is left to actually change the pathway we are on. So I, as an activist, find it very tiring to repeat and repeat and repeat that we have no time when, in fact, we actually have no time. But it's not a useful framing, I find, because it stresses people out and they say, don't panic, whereas actually we all should be panicking in a constructive way. So the first question would be, what would you uh, think how to deal with the time constraints we have in, in the aspect of the climate crisis? And the second question is about media. I, too, complain about media. Most people do because it's just difficult to deal with a very conservative, very reactionary media world that is in love with white privileged kids. Um, but then I feel, OK, we might not be able to change the world of media as fast as we needed to. So my question there would be, what would you advise people to do in terms of messaging, in terms of framing, how to deal with a media that would naturally not put those on the front pages that we need, where we need them to be. Thanks. Thank you. So the first question about having little time to take action and not panicking and doing something constructive. Micah, do you want to start us off? Um, yeah, I mean, I can respond to the first one. I think that the, OK, it's like there is no time. But at the same time, we know that that kind of urgency mindset shuts down our creativity. Like, it is true that you know if you're in a panic, you're oftentimes not going to just try to open the door. You know what I mean? You're freaking out, and the door is just like standing open over there. So it's, it, it's a challenge. I mean, there is enough time, but it's close to running out of time. So I think I, I agree that the urgency mindset shuts down the mind, but at the same time, there is very little time left. So it's, it's, it is extremely difficult. Um, but I think that, look, at the end of the, I, I think at the end of this decade, there will be no time. So we do our best. You know what I mean? But there is no real answer to it. It's, it's, it's extremely difficult. Yeah, the, both those questions were extremely difficult to answer. <laughs> so, and for the media question, I mean, I think it'd be great to send it to you, Naomi, because you talk a lot about the lack of diversity. Yeah. What do you think? Um, the media does a really great job um, at glorifying and putting um, white privileged kids, as you said, at the center of every movement. Um, I've met so many black and brown girls who have experienced violence and who have to duck from bullets to get to school, but then we think of who we actually see on TV talking about those kind of situations. Um, there are so many um, young girls of color girl and women of color who have been working their entire lives um, for them, um, try fighting for their voices to be heard, um, knowing that they don't have um, an equal chance at gaining that attention and getting that recognition, yet they still continue. Um, I think that that resilience is so admirable, but it's it's sad when we don't hear their names and we don't know who they are, and they're just they're non-existent to us. Because when we look on the news, we see the white kids who are doing making a difference, and we see the white kids who are speaking out. But then we see some of the same black and brown kids who are saying the exact same thing and are not getting any attention for it. So I think that it's the media's problem. Um, how could we go about fixing it? I think that we can raise awareness um, and we can stop being so comfortable in the way we look at things. I think that we can challenge ourselves um, in the certain faces that we think of when we think of somebody who is successful, somebody who has a lot of money, someone who is educated. When I say those words, you might think of a white person, but maybe we can start thinking of other people. We can challenge ourselves in the way that we think, like I said. So I think that the media and TV, TV shows and books and movies have conditioned us to think a certain way. So I think it's important if we start to look outside of that box, because even I, um, growing up, have always wanted the white doll, or have always wanted to be like the white princess. Um, and just seeing how that is scary, seeing how that affects us. But I think that um, there's nothing, like you said, we can really do about the media, because that's a really big issue, and it's um, a culture. But I think we can do our, it ourselves and change the way that we think. I think like Maxime and Michelle was telling us earlier, we have to become the media in a way, and we have to grow up and change that ourselves if we want to see truly meaningful change. Yeah, you, you, you have to change the game. If those medias don't want to cover your actions, then, well, you don't need them. You can, I mean, um, the system um, of media coverage is exploding now. You have traditional newspaper, 
but you also have other opportunities uh, through social media, through, through Twitter, or, or whatever. But so change the game, change the narrative, and you are the one presenting your actions. And if they don't want to present your actions, then you don't care, and you can just use other ways to do it. Do we have any more questions in the audience? Oh, OK, yeah. OK, so my name is Emily, and my question is, as an activist, I understand that success would be uh, making a change, but what do you define as failure? Is it giving up? Is it hitting a wall? Well, I, I'd like to throw this one over to Micah, since you you know coined the term constructive failure. What yeah. do you think failure represents? Well, look, I mean, I, what I'm trying to say is it's it's very difficult time to be an activist because, like, like like I said, when I started doing activism, uh, activism was not cool, and there were no, really no very few act activists. It just wasn't a thing that people wanted to do. So now it's completely flipped where you can be an activist and you're kind of celebrated by the media. And one of the things, one of the, one of the tricks that happens with that though is changing and lowering the definition of success. So like the definition of success for activists for 300 years has been uh, political revolution, gaining control of the government, et cetera, et cetera. So from that metric, Occupy failed. That was at our time we wanted a kind of regime change just like they had in the Arab Spring. So what, I, what I'm saying is that um, I think, in, you, I think you have to be honest with yourself about defining success, and, what, and, then fi, and then failure means not achieving that. I think that you also be, have to be very careful with lowering the bar of success such that it just means changing the discourse, for example. This is one thing that's really irked me about Occupy, is people will say, well, Occupy was a success. Now we talk about income inequality. I'm like, well, that was not the goal. That is just merely a symptom. If you create a, a movement as big as Occupy Wall Street, obviously it's going to change the discourse. But that doesn't mean that you've succeeded in eradicating income inequality or any of these other things. So, so right now, I think there's a, there's a, they, they want you to believe that failure is impossible, that we're always succeeding. I think there's a really, at least in America, a very positive narrative around these kind of things. Um, so I think it's up, to, it's up to the activists to define what the success would mean for their movement and really holding to that goal. Um, because one of the ways they will, they will push you aside now is to say, no, no, you succeeded, you succeeded. You didn't achieve what you wanted, but you achieved this other thing. So move along, move along. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? <laughs> we have, sorry, there's a microphone coming. You've spoken about, uh, on, on the panel, about how important it is going forward that in the next 10 years, we significantly change the way that we tackle climate change. Um, the most thorough proposals that have been put forward by politicians thus far, like the Green New Deal and, and such things, are very much looking at restructuring the way that our global economy works. We know that we're going in one direction and we sort of have to start going the other way if we want to make real changes. On top of how polarizing figures like Greta Thunberg already are, how do you then convince people that the capitalist society that works very well for those in power is no longer suitable? <laughs> How do you convince people? Um, okay, look. Um, so the, the 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 what's being offered to activists is this idea that I w that I heard from a high-ranking WEF person. I won't say who. High-ranking WEF WEF World Economic Forum person, which is basically that um, a change of system is no longer possible, but systems change is possible. So. We, can, we, we can't have an alternative to capitalism, but we can have stakeholder capitalism, right? Um, so I think, I think what, what I would say is that um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a really tr I think it's a really tricky time to be an activist right now. I think a lot of what I'm trying to say is that a lot of the, the goals and objectives of the last 300 years of activism are being called into question. And though while, while I find it distasteful to, to, to agree, fine, a change of system is off the table, I think that um, if that's the cost of, of a massive, I mean, and I don't mean like a fake mobilization, I mean like an unprecedented mobilization that we've never seen before in human history of hundreds of millions of, okay, if we can have that, then fine, a change of system is off the table. But if the, at the end of this 10 years, if that hasn't happened, that all the promises that are being made right now turn out to be false, then it's going to be a change of systems big time. You know what I mean? So yeah, which is, I think it, just being honest with you is a very difficult uh, choice for activists to take. And we all have to choose our own path. Thank you. If we could take a question from the front, please. That would be great.
Um, I've got a question for Micah. Uh, so my name is Aurelia McNichol. I did half my career in industry and the other half uh, as a teacher. So I've been a teacher for 15 years. And I can see in the classroom that um, many of the students these days feel completely overwhelmed. I think we're in a situation where they don't see, I can't remember the English expression, they don't see, they don't see the, the tree from the wood. They just, they just feel overwhelmed by all the, the crises, the difficulties, um, and they also find it very hard to uh, be discerning from what's right and wrong and what news, who can we rely on, etc. And I wanted to see if your experience over the last 25 years of being an activist is similar in the way social media is, is great, but equally sometimes it's really uh, paralyzing people. There's just too much information, so difficult to know what to tackle, how to tackle it, and to feel powerless. So I wanted your experience. Um, no, I mean, I think it's a really time, tough time to be a young person. I mean, we weren't having these kinds of dire, catastrophic conversations when I was 13 years old. We just weren't. And I have a four-year-old child, and I think about, like, at what age do I start to have these conversations? So I absolutely think it's, it's, it's normal to be having climate grief and all of these kind of things. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I think that the key is to take that leap. You know, like the only way we're going to get out of this situation is um, basically a suspension of the status quo. Like we need to be given a pro like we need to be given permission by all this society to stop earning an income and start planting trees is basically what has to happen. I mean, that's how they planted 350 trees in Ethiopia. Is they just declared a public holiday. So I think that the, the only way for young people to start feeling better is if we just give them permission. It's like, fine, stop going to school, like plant some trees. That's OK. Like, Maybe we don't go to school for the next 10 years. Maybe we could, like, there, but, but you can't just do that until someone says to you, I'll still let you get into college, or you can still earn an income. Like, most people can't make that decision. So I think that we should just tell them, like, it's absolutely normal. And then we also have to give them permission to start working on it. Because how paralyzing it is to know that the world is collapsing around you, but you have to take a math test. It's like, <laughs> why is this mattering? You know what I mean? So we have to give them permission to, like, to, to act as if the world is collapsing, you know? So. And now, I just want to add on, the rest of us grew up with technology and with social media. And I want to ask the three of you, how do you cope with like, seeing all this influx of information and having had access to that for basically our entire lives? Does anyone want to start us off? I think that um, I slightly <coughs> disagree with Micah because we can't stop going to school because then we're not going to be educated. We won't have a formal education. And when we don't have a formal education, we're probably not going to be able to go to college. And then what is the future after that? I mean, we're fighting for our future, but if we don't go to school, wh what do we do? And so I feel that there are ways to mobilize and do work while still getting an education, while still doing school. And I do agree in the sense that um, uh, I can learn probably more being here and speaking and listening to other people talk than I can by d taking a math test and learning what two times two is. But it, I mean, it's, it comes to, it's to a certain extent, um, it gets to a point where we need to, um, like you said, prioritize. And so our education is very important because like um, Maxime said, we want to be the future leaders, we want to be the journalists, we want to be the um, politicians, but if we don't go to school and we don't get an education because we're focused on something that we can multitask, we're, we're not going to be able to do that. And now, <laughs> um, I think instead of stopping and not going to school, I think you could just tie it into the education system and kind of make it almost like a mandatory yeah. course or however the education system works over here and um, just make it something mandatory to learn, like climate change or environmental science. So. Thank you. And I want to tie in, I think, we talked about sometimes systems, like political systems not always working for the change we want to see, but here <coughs> education isn't necessarily keeping up with the way we need, need it because you were saying, oh, well, we can't just leave school because I need to be educated so I can go to college. Yeah. But isn't that kind of where you realize, well, if you can't, like, is, education is almost preventing you from being able to do things because of the way education is set up. So I guess my question to you would be, before we move on to another audience question, sorry, would be, how would you change the education system for it to better fit today's changing lifestyle? Because it's clearly not keeping up. Yeah, sorry. I, I feel like school today is about 
um, passing, not learning. So they don't want to make sure that you understand the concepts and make sure that you're able to implement what you just learned into real life situations. They want you to know this math equation so that you can pass the test, so that you can pass the so that you can pass the class, so that you can pass the grade. I mean, it's just this whole chain, and I feel like a lot of what we're learning isn't really um, related to what we could be doing. Um, I, I was in Spanish class, and we were learning about how a lot of people who are studying in the, studying in the medical field um, started knowing, thinking about what they wanted to do when they were like my age. And by the time they were like 18, 19, 20, they were already a medical intern because they started that entire um, like uh, thinking process beforehand, and especially in the United States, um, you have to get an education. And private versus public education is an issue too, because I I attend a private school, but that means that I might get a better better education than a kid who goes to a public school in an inner city. But that's not fair, because then I'm probably going to have the education to be able to go to the high school and be able to go to the college. But if their school isn't teaching them what's necessary, they're not going to be able to do that, which means they're not going to be able to have a successful future. And a lot of that is defining success. And so I. A lot of what's considered successful is being is money and having the having power, being in a position of power. Um, and I think that when we think about, um, we always assume that the brilliant mind is going to come from a kid with all the resources. The kid who goes to the private school, the kid who lives in the upper class family, the kid who studies abroad, that kid. We don't think about the kids in the inner city, and we don't think about the kids who um, have to worry about where their next meal is coming from because they're not even they're they're not thoughts in the back of our mind. And so I think that the school the school system is pretty flawed. Well, I think we have time for one last question from the audience. There's one in the front, one in the back. Hello, my name is Willemijn. I'm from the Netherlands. And I just have a question. Would you be able or willing uh, to partner up as an activist with an entrepreneur to seek for your goals as I seek for my goals? We have developed a disruptive uh, product, which is a paint powder, um, which can be really uh, impactful on, in the industry and on the climate. But I'm having the same problem as you have, that my, the industry doesn't want me because I'm too disruptive. So I need ambassadors, ambassadors like you to help me achieve actually the goal we all have. So are, are you willing to collaborate in order to make it happen uh, in the time that we have? Maxime, you discussed a lot of, about entrepreneurship, being both, I guess, a youth activist and you know, seeing that perspective to it. What do you think? Um, Sorry. I think that's a great idea. Great idea. Uh, I don't really know the details, so. I'm going to speak in a general, general way. Um, <clears throat> entrepreneurship is often tainted with a bad reputation. People, greedy people only seeking for money. But I don't believe it's necessar necessarily true. Um, I believe that business can be used for, for achieving the SDGs for um, great purposes. And in that sense, um, are we more, more than happy to, to know more about your project? <laughs> I can't do anything without asking my mom. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for being such a good audience, and I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking our panelists once more.